Hey everyone, it is Dave here and I'm super stoked to be taking you through my full 3D asset creation workflow. I hope you'll join me as we turn this basic sphere into a living, breathing cuttlefish. Let's get into it. The programs I'll be using today are ZBrush, Cinema 4D and Substance Painter. However, these techniques will be just as applicable in programs such as Blender and Maya. Let's get started by sculpting in ZBrush. Using a sphere as a base, I'm going to start off by creating the primary forms. I'm using the move brush to manipulate the mesh and block out the main silhouette of the cuttlefish. It's important to do this as early as possible because it's much easier to adjust the model when the resolution is still fairly low. It's important to note that I'm working symmetrically. This will allow me to save half the time and also make it much easier for rigging later on. I'm then going to use the snake hook brush to drag out some tentacles and because they're looking quite thin, I'm going to give them some more mass using the inflate brush. Switching to the top view, I'm just going to manipulate them into place and then drag out the main tentacle at the back. I'm then using the clay build up brush. This helps add extra mass and texture and I'm just going to smooth over it to create some nice crevices where the tentacles meet the body. Using snake hook, I'm going to drag out some fins and move them into place, once again inflating them to give them more mass. I'm going to reposition them in the top view and then work on the silhouette of the head, blocking out some basic details such as the eye sockets. It's time to work on the details of the face a bit, so I'm going to slice in some crevices using the Damien standard. And then masking over a rough shape of the mouth, I'm going to invert it and actually pull it inside of that mesh to create a mouth cavity. I'm then going to use Dynamesh to redistribute the polygons over the model. If you're wondering what Dynamesh is, I've just pulled out these horns on this sphere and you can see how horribly distorted the topology is. By pressing Dynamesh, it automatically recalculates the surface for us, allowing us to sculpt without limitations. I'm going to use the same technique for the nostrils, just masking and then pulling them inside the mesh, Dynameshing and smoothing again. For the spikes on the body, I'm using the clay build up just to mark some rough indications of where the spikes should be and then using the snake hook, I'm actually going to pull them out to extrude out that geometry. We're in a good place now, we've established the primary forms of the cuttlefish, now it's time to up the resolution and add some more detail. Using clay build up, I'm going to go around the eye socket and add some more mass, and then inverting the brush, I'm going to cut in some eye sockets. Then for the eyes themselves, we're going to append in a sphere, which we're going to move into place using the gizmo. After that's done, we're going to go up to the Z plugin, subtool master and mirror, mirror on the X axis, and now we have two eyeballs. Using the clay build up, I'm going to go around the edges of the mouth, and create some lips as well as the nostrils just adding in some extra details all around the face. The cuttlefish is a chunky boy so it's time to give him some flabs. We're going to build up some mass using the clay build up and then smooth over it and cut in those nice folds using the Damien standard brush. Up to this point we've been using Dynamesh which is great for freeform sculpting but leaves us with horrendous topology and is no bueno for UV unwrapping and such. In order to fix this, we're going to duplicate our current subtool and rename it just so we can discern between the two. I'm going to call it Remesh. Then under the Z Remesher tab, I'm going to hit half and keep creases and then we're just going to press the Z Remesh button. As you can see, it's automatically cleaned up our topology, adding edge loops where we need them. And because the resolution is still a bit high, I'm just going to keep hitting that button with half selected and every time we do so, it's going to halve the polygon count. At this point, it looks like a downgrade to PlayStation 1 graphics, but don't worry, we can fix this by projecting the details from our high poly to our low poly mesh. We're going to subdivide the model to meet the original mesh's poly count, and then enable the visibility, come down to the project tab and hit project all. Once it's finished, we can turn off the visibility of the original mesh, and there we have the high poly details baked onto the low poly mesh. There's a bit of issues, particularly with those spikes, but that's nothing a bit of smoothing can't fix. It's now time to add the final details to our cuttlefish. We're working with about 2 million polygons, which gives us more than enough headroom to add in those final details such as crevices and folds near the eyes as well. He definitely needs some teeth, so we're going to append in a cube, and I'm just going to position that to the rough scale and size of an individual tooth. I'm then going to duplicate this several times, positioning each one manually until we've filled out the mouth. We now need to UV unwrap our model so that we can export the displacements so we're not dealing with a 2 million polygon object. To do this, we're going to export using the Go ZBrush plugin. I'm just going to hit continue and that'll open in Cinema 4D. For my UV unwrapping, I'm going to be using Rhizom UV. If you have no idea what UVs or unwrapping is, then keep watching and I'll explain it in just a sec. 
This used to confuse me too, but it really helped me to think about it, like making a paper dice back in, say, primary school, where you would cut out the outline of the shape on a flat piece of paper, and then you would fold that to create a 3D mesh. It's the same technique, which is unfolding our model onto a 2D surface, which we can then paint textures onto. You might have noticed the red and blue colors on the mesh. Those are bad because they're signs of UV distortion, so we're going to add additional cuts to make sure that those colors disappear. After that, I'm going to lay them out on the UV tile, making sure none of them intersect. This funny looking checkerboard allows us to determine how much space on the UV tile each island is taking up. I'm noticing that the tentacles are a bit smaller than everything else, so I'm going to scale them up, and now you can see the checkerboard is equal. I'm then going to do one final pack of the UV islands, making sure that none of them go outside of the bounds. And there is our model fully UV unwrapped. We're then going to send this back into ZBrush and hitting the Morph UV button, we can check that our UVs are indeed working. The last step is to export out our displacement and normal maps to allow us to get our high poly details onto our low poly mesh. This will allow us to apply all of that high level detail that we created at render time instead of on the actual model itself. This is great for animation and massively saves performance. With all of the modeling out of the way, let's now take this into Substance Painter for texturing. Now that we've loaded our model into Substance Painter, the first step is to go to the Texture Set settings and scroll all the way down until we see Bake Mesh Maps. And now we're able to load in that normal map that we exported from ZBrush. You can see just how much detail this adds if I toggle it off and then back on again. There's some really great procedural generators that require us to bake the other mesh maps. I'll show you later on how Substance Painter uses these maps that we've just baked out. We're going to go to the asset browser and search for skin, and we're just going to grab the calf skin and place it right onto our body. Now it looks super weird at first, but we're going to play around with some settings, such as the scale and the height position, to get something that more closely resembles the cuttlefish. You'll notice that he has a different material on the top side of his body, so we're going to search for silicon and just drag the silicon coat material right onto the body. This gives us a good base that we can start working off of. I'm going to tweak some more parameters such as the scale to really dial in the desired result. We're then going to add a black mask to that material, which is going to make it disappear, but we're able to paint over that mask and reveal the material. I'm then going to enable symmetry because we modeled it to be perfectly equal on both sides, and this will save us half the work. I'm then going to switch to my side view, painting over the mask and revealing the areas according to the reference images. The tentacles are a bit trickier, so we're going to need to switch to the top view to make sure that we're getting proper coverage over the top of them. Right now, the transition between the two materials is a bit too stark, so we're going to soften this with the use of low opacity brushes and different brush alphas, such as this moldy one I've got right here. After that, we can apply some blur filters, which will give us a really nice blend between the two materials. I'm going to duplicate this silicon material, delete the mask for the time being, and then add a fresh one, which we're going to add a generator to. I'm going to pick the dirt generator, and this is a procedural mask that uses those maps that we baked before to add extra detail in those crevices. Now we're going to duplicate silicon one more time, call it green and remove the mask. We're then going to change the color and then add a brand new mask, which we're going to start painting over the face with to give it some color variation. I'm just going to keep going over the body with a low opacity brush. By inverting the brush color, I'm able to subtract away from that silicon material and reveal that iconic cuttlefish stripe. I'm then going to go around the edges of the model with another light green material. This will add extra color variation and detail to the body. For his eyes, I'm using an eye generator. This allows you to change the type of pupil, the pupil size, as well as the color of the eyes, which I'm setting to a brownie orange. I'll also play around with some parameters, such as normal intensity and roughness, to achieve the desired result. It's time for final details, so I'm painting in some crevices by hand, as well as painting on some of those splotches that you see underneath the cheeks. Then using a really harsh circle brush alpha, I'm going to paint a bunch more of these dots all over the body. This part is super relaxing and adds a bunch of extra character to our cuttlefish. I'm going to create another material and paint it over the spikes, just to separate it and give it some more clarity from the body. To top it off, I'll add in some crevice details as well. I'll add in a noise texture to the roughness channel to break up that perfectly smooth surface. Finally, I'll add some height detail to those bumps, keeping it nice and subtle. Congratulations, we now have a fully textured cuttlefish. Let's export out these maps at a 4K resolution, and then once ready, we're just going to hit the export button. 
Substance Paint is going to export out a bunch of unique texture maps. Each one will define a particular attribute of the material, such as what color and how rough the material should be. I'll drag the textures for the body right into Redshift and hook them up using their respective inputs and outputs. After adding in some quick lighting, this is what we get. The model itself is now complete, it's looking really nice, but it's time for that final step, bringing it to life. Let's get into animation. How would we do this? Because if we grab a bunch of polygons and drag them, that just deforms a mesh. So we need to create a joint based rig, which is the skeleton of the cuttlefish. It is crucial to keep the joint chain inside of the mesh at all times. I'm going to duplicate this to the upper tentacle and adjust it accordingly. And then switching to a top view, we're going to make sure that it also is inside of the mesh. We're going to add in a joint chain for the fin. You'll notice that currently all of our joints are on the left side of the model, apart from the spine. We'll use the mirror tool in the clone mode. You can see it's currently set from positive to negative on the X axis. What we want is negative to positive. So let's switch that and then we can just hit mirror. It's that easy. Now we have a symmetrical rig and it's even renamed it for us. I'll continue this process, adding additional joint chains for the middle tentacle and the eyes. If we try to animate at this point, you'll see that the joints have no effect on the mesh. This is because we haven't actually bound the joints to anything. To do this, we're going to create a weight tag on our body, select all of our joints and drag them right into that weight tag. Next, let's add a skin object as a child of the body, allowing it to deform. Up next is the rather tedious process of binding individual points to each respective joint. This process is crucial in ensuring that the bones deform the mesh correctly. You can also see that every different joint has a unique color in the viewport. I'll continue working my way up the spine, binding each different joint. You can clearly see the color correlating with the influence of each joint, for example the neck and the head. The deformation here is smooth, unlike in this example, where you can see the blotchy influence of that joint. To fix this we can hit the smooth command several times which will smooth out the influence. Because we named our joints R and L respectively, we can work symmetrically. Once completed you should have a nice colorful looking mesh. I'll then add in some spline controllers, parenting them to each different joint, allowing us to grab different parts of the rig much easier. The end result is an animation friendly rig that gives us a visual depiction of what the different joints are doing. Instead of having to sift through a long joint hierarchy, we can just grab the on-screen spline controller and start moving it right away. The tentacles also have dynamics applied, allowing the computer to do most of the work for us. I created the animation using Cinema 4D's C motion system. This is perfect for repeatable cyclical animation. And just like that, our cuttlefish has now come to life. I've actually uploaded the model online to a platform called Sketchfab. You guys are able to check out the model for yourselves at the link in the description. If you'd like to see the animation, you can switch it from static pose to swimming animation. This gives you a playful little cuttlefish right inside of your web browser. What's really cool is you can hit the model inspector, which brings up a pane with various different options. You can view the wireframe for the cuttlefish, as well as the bones. You can see the rig that we created there. You can check out the bones influence, which is how they're weighted to the mesh, and the different material channels like metalness and the normal map. You can even check how the UVs were unwrapped. All right, I know that was a lot to take in guys, but I really hope you can see just how much work goes into a single asset for a film or a game. At the very least, now you have a cute cuttlefish that you can view right in your web browser. To you loyal folks who stuck around till the end, I wanted to let you know that I'm potentially working on a Subnautica 3 concept trailer. What this means is a one to two minute trailer focused around visual set pieces and what I would wanna see in the next Subnautica game. I've come up with brand new biome concepts as well as a terrifying new Leviathan which I can't wait to share with you guys. And I really want to hear from you. If you have any story ideas, any biome or creature designs as well, please let me know down in the comments below or shoot me a message on Reddit. I'm super open to suggestions as I don't have a timeline or release date for this yet. That is all from me guys. I really hope you enjoyed this one and I'll catch you in the next one.